gentlemen and welcome to the library history channel on focus on liberia my name is dennis jai and we are broadcasting from atlanta georgia tonight is part three of our series the history of our culture the history of our culture this is part three and we're going to be delving into more history of our culture with me tonight is your usual presenter call call welcome to the show it's always my pleasure to be here dennis well, we want to welcome all our viewers from across the globe. Tonight is our topic, the history of our culture. That is examining the unique historical experiences that make us Liberian. This is part three. That means we have had part one and part two. If you want to follow, go on our Facebook or YouTube channel. You'll see the, on the YouTube channel, you will see the hist Library History Channel playlist and look at the past two episodes of the history of our culture. Carl, uh, let's uh, do a, a quick review and where we are today. We started with part one, part two, now we are on part three. Yeah, so part one, we kind of talked about the um, pre-Liberia cultural uh, development. Um, the, we talked about the fluidity of our ethnic, our ethnic groups. We talked about um, uh, Islam and its impact on the region. And then uh, part two, uh, we talked about recaptured Africans and their, their um, input or contribution to um, the cultural context of Liberia. So today um, we're go we were we were we uh, excuse me I'm so tired sorry today we're going to focus on um, the evolution of our culture as far as it comes to religion and how that ties into the Westernization of Liberia the Liberian population so we're going to talk about a lot of that today good. And so culture is the way we do things, right? The way we talk, yes. what we eat, we're wearing clothes. And so uh, from our previous uh, episode, we're saying, hey, the way you see us today come from right. somewhere. These are all the influences that are on us to make us who we are today. So if you see me uh, talking with my Sherylonian and uh, Gravel accent, it comes from somewhere. If you, mm -hmm. what I eat, the way we talk. So 
like the last episode, we're talking about the impact of uh, our brothers and sisters from uh, the recapture Africans and how even the way they build their houses, mm -hmm. what they brought with them, we still have that today. So, I, I mean, I'm liking this and I'm getting positive feedback from our viewers that, uh, you know, is trying to give people a kind of new way to look at us. Yeah. It shouldn't be a new way, right? It should be, it, it, it is what it is. It's, really? I don't know why, you know, you I don't know. Don't look really at ourselves that way. You know, every time we look at ourselves, I mean, from my experience, and I could be mm -hmm. wrong, it's uh, this, uh, uh, I don't want to call it division per se, but it's like we compartmentalize it, you know, this group, this part, this part. Yeah. But if you look at it, we all, we all eat cassava leaves. We all talk <laughs> the same way. So all these things that make us us, we want to talk about them and how we get to be where we right. are today. I got it. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, for a lot of us who did not experience, you know, fully growing up in Liberia and all of these things, I think from the outside, we see everything as one anyway. Yeah. So when I approach history, my interpretation is always, no matter who it is, they're part of me. <laughs> so yeah. if I'm looking at, 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 at somebody, you know, coming from, from, from global land, I'm not thinking of them as different from myself because when you grow up outside of Liberia, everything Liberia is you, you embrace all of it. And so, you know, it, it, it's something that for me is just natural. I don't see Mm -hmm. I don't see the differences as much as the similarities. So when I see things that someone else sees, they might see it in a in a, a way that's different. But I just want to point out that perhaps the reason yeah. I focus on the similarities is just because of the way I grew up. And, and you are right, because it happens to us when we left Liberia. So we mm -hmm. left Liberia. The first place I went was Guinea. So when we were in Guinea, we didn't see ourselves as separate people again. We're yeah. all again, we have one big name called refugees. And so in fact, the Guineans <laughs> look yeah. us like that. They don't even care if they were in a car and they, hey, refugee approach it. <laughs> <Let's, Yeah. let's laughs> you know, so it and now uh, you're in America and somebody asked me recently, say, Oh, what music you listen to? And I started playing all these labrain music, and they were shocked. I said, No, what happened is when we leave home, we want more of home. Yeah, so the things that we miss, we enjoy them so much. We want to eat. We want to eat the Liberian stuff. We want to stay. So that's what makes us now to focus on Liberia as a whole, and yeah. not just our little cleavages anymore. And I, exactly, I, I was joking with somebody um, the other day, and they were saying, "Oh, why are you calling Gus Red your uncle and he's a boss of it?" I said, "Because we're growing up in Minnesota. Every Liberian man or uncle, every Liberian woman more into." Yeah, we didn't know. I didn't know Uncle Gus Rewa Basa, and I didn't know, you know, it didn't matter. No. <laughs> Nobody said, Oh, they better Basa. Oh, I knew Uncle Gus Rewa was my uncle. And the same thing, I mean, um, we grew up going to, they had different meetings and stuff like or organizations like St. Paul River District. And then um, Jeff Bates would take us to St. Paul River District meetings. And then on the other hand, we'll be going to Basa Doba meetings, we'll be going to Unico meetings, and the same group of children just passing from hand to hand, from meeting to meeting. Yeah. So we that's how that's how we were raised. And anybody that grew up in Minnesota <laughs> with me knows that very well. Um, and so uh I was actually shocked when I went to Liberia and saw that people were so focused, hyper focused on ethnicity. Um, yeah. I will bring in one more thing before we start the show. Mm -hmm. If you invite a friend, you know, we want to talk about the history of our culture. So there's a new thing about, you know, when it comes to government changes and people are, you know, looking for jobs because people want to go back home and work. And then so this right. whole idea of diaspora Liberian and this Liberian, it, 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 it comes up only when it comes to the time of jobs right, so I, told <laughs> right. Someone, I, I told someone i said we are all one people when first of all we go and they say hey come you you build you you build your house you know you put your family people in or friends all that we are still one people yes the only time this separation comes is 
when people are trying to go for government, you say, oh, no, no, you diaspora person, you can work here. But besides that, we are all one people. Yeah. I said this to say that uh, the things that divide us are big, those kind of things. Generally, we look at ourselves when we know that we are one people, we are doing things the same. It is mm -hmm. only when it comes to politics and other things that really shouldn't, but because we focus on them or hyper-focus on them, and then we see ourselves as just that smaller, smaller group. Yeah. But we are all one. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's go to today, the history of our culture, examining the unique historical experiences that make us Liberians. Historical experiences, and they are unique. Yes. So we have, of course, I've said this in the first uh, history of our culture, there are some things that are West African, that West Africans experienced in common. But the way Liberia experienced um, many of the things have been very unique and different. We have similarities with Sierra Leone, of course, but not exactly, right? So there's, as we talk about this, it explains our acts and explains so many things, the way we speak, the food we eat, the way we worship, our whole outlook on the world. So today we're focusing on how Christianity affected our general culture. Even those of us who were, you know, in the interior, for example, we're going to talk about a lot of things. The first misnomer is that Christianity was introduced um, to the Grain Coast in 1822. And if you watch the episode Basaw 360, where we look at 360 years of Basaw history, and that ends actually, we ended that episode right around 1800, or not 1800, about 1820. So Basaw 360, if you look on a um, playlist for the History Channel, please go back and watch that. So Christianity has been on the coast for a very long time, even before, even before the transatlantic slave trade, the Great Coast had people who were in touch with Christians and started, you know, practicing some form of Christianity on a very small scale, but it still was there. So Christianity was not introduced to the Grain Coast by repatriated African Americans or by the American Colonization Society or you know any of that. So we're gonna start out, um, I'm not gonna go as far back as Basel 360 because it would be repetitive, just go and mm -hmm. watch that. Um, Basel 360 part one and two. Um, we're actually gonna start this um, episode uh, right around 1819, about one year before the Elizabeth set sail from New York for Sherbro Island. So we're going to begin the episode, I mean, this, this story of the introduction of Christianity around that time. So you can go ahead, Dennis. Right. So this is a photo um, that, that covers uh, Mr. Kate's it's part of the, the uh, Mr. Kate's letter. It's a it was an engraving, and it's a it's a copy, a photocopy of an engraving that uh, Mr. Kate uh, took in uh, 1819. Now this is supposed to be at Bassa, you know what is now considered Grand Bassa County. So this is at Bassa, and or what they called Little Bassa at the time, which is um, in present day Grand Bassa County. So at Little Bassa, he took this engraving and basically it is of supposedly a, a traditional um, uh, masked dancer or a masked performer. And you have, uh, you know, two European Americans, Mr. Cates and one of his colleagues. And then you have a black westernized man all three of them are missionaries. So you've got the so-called uh, masked dancer, what we call the, the, the country devil. And you've got three missionaries, one of whom is a black missionary. This is before, this is before ACS. This is 1819. And I want to point out that the black missionary, according to Mr. Case, was a Basa man, and this was he's the one who carried the people there. So he's a missionary, and he's carrying the two European American missionaries to Grand Basa to, you know, to to spread the word of Christ. 
His name is Mr. Davis. And it's very important because Mr. Davis was a liberated enslaved person, meaning Mr. Davis was rescued by the British off the coast of what is now Liberia, and that ship was liberated to Sierra Leone. Mr. Davis is then baptized. He's basically a recaptured African, but he's from right down the coast, mm -hmm. from Basel, but he's Sierra Leone now, being westernized, Christianized, and now he becomes an evangelist and wants to go back to this place of origin and spread the gospel to his people. Very, very interesting. And this is happening before the ship Elizabeth ever left the coast of New York. And Cole, let, let's, uh, let me stop you right there because this is very important. I know we spoke about this in previous episodes about Christianity on the Green Coast or mm -hmm. where we are today. That this happened before the uh, repatriated Africans. Yes. Right? So, because it is very easy, even though the admission to was to Christianize, but it's very easy for us to think that it was the coming of the uh, settlers that brought Christianity to that part. But you're saying even before Elizabeth, Elizabeth was not going to Liberia, before that time, mm -hmm. there were Liberian missionaries, like uh, Basel people preaching. Yes. So this, but it, it's very important to mention, remember it, it, we talked about recaptured Africans last time? Yeah. And I said that many of the recaptured Africans were liberated from right in the grain coast. So, so yeah. the so-called freed or liberated enslaved people, a lot of them came from right there. Right. Right, and a lot of them never left really the coast of the African continent. So here are Basa people that were taken probably from Trade Town because that was the most active slave trading depot in the Basa yeah. region probably taken from trade town, the British caught the illegal slaver, liberated the people at Freetown. And then you've got these Basa people who've been liberated at Freetown, amongst others, because we've looked at some of the rosters for the people who were liberated at Freetown in another episode that Jerome gave in and I did. But here you have these, this man, Davis, he's now taking the name Davis. He's, he was old enough to know he was Basa when he was liberated and he wants to go back now and evangelize to his people. He wants to carry the word to his people. But I want you to read Mr. Um, Cates's letter. It's the next two slides, mm -hmm. which explain it very well, please. Right, and, 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 and that particular piece of information about Christianity there, and I'm writing that down, so we'll come back to that later on, because another, one of the uh, viewers who have the same idea about Which is why, what? why we think that these things began with the coming of the ex-slaves. Why people, so this, this writer say, the ex-slaves love to take credit for everything that happened in Liberia. So it is, it is, is it the matter of people taking credit to say, okay, we did this or people ascribing these things to them? It may be a combination of both, right? We all went to the same schools. We all think the same thoughts. We all have the same beliefs. And so it's a combination of both. It is it, where where have we seen a so-called indigenous Liberian set a different narrative except for on this history channel? Right. Even when our writers write, even when our historians write, that's the story they narrate. They don't go back. They don't talk about Mr. Davis. They don't talk about Basel 360. And hundreds of years ago, the interaction and the baptisms and the Christianity that was on the coast. So whose fault is that? We have scholars too. So it's a combination of both. The thing is, everybody's cut from the same cloth in Liberia. We're all yeah. thinking the same way. Because we went to the same class. We all sat in the same <laughs> class. There was no segregation. We're taught the same things. So we all believe the, the same thing about ourselves and about our country regardless of what our, our ethnic background is. And nobody ever questions it. And so the reason you see it being questioned is because, you know, some of us, I have not been cooked in the same in the same pot as, 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 as everybody else. So we look at it with fresh eyes, but the evidence is overwhelming. But I do advise that, you know, you go back and watch Basel 360. It's, it's, it's one of my favorite um, episodes of the History Channel. 
we put a lot of work into that research. It, so yeah. if you have an opportunity, go and watch it. So let's read the extract of a letter from Mr. Cates to the Secretary of the Church Missionary Society dated April 19, 1819. After experiencing manifold mercies for 10 weeks, we have been brought back in health and safety. The prospect of success you will learn from my journal. In several places, there is a willingness to receive missionaries, particularly in the Basel country of which William Davis is a native. During four days that we remained at Kingstown, I was called on three or four times in a day to read and explain the word of God to them. Why they heard with marked attention and devised every means that they could the, that they could to retain it in their memories. The headmen from the different towns in King John's dominions assembled and consulted on the propriety of receiving teachers. There was not a single dis, dissent, dissenting voice, but on the contrary, many among whom the king was foremost were, were anxious that we should speedily send some person to them. The king willingly acquiesced in a proposal which I made to him to place William Davis among his countrymen as a teacher. And though, and though he would have been glad to receive an European, acknowledged the propriety of commencing the mission with an African, should the people show the sincerity of their desire to receive instruction by a diligent attendance on him, it will be an encouragement afterward to send an European. There are many other places where missionaries will be gladly received, but they do not appear so well suited to begin with an African. Has the principal men have, from long acquaintance with Englishmen, made such progress in civilization, has to possess general knowledge superior to any of our Christian Negroes? This is the case particularly in Galenans where there are some families who received the liberal education in England during the triumph of the slave trade. They are still much addicted to this nefarious traffic, but are so far convinced of the advantage of education that they will receive a white missionary, though they will treat contemptuously any attempt to send a liberated slave to them. What, are you not? Are you stuck on something or? No. Okay, got the second part. Sorry. Yeah, that's it. So, yeah, let's yeah. let's talk about this first before we proceed. All right. So, do you have any questions on this? Is there anything that stuck out for you? Well, I mean, starting from what we said before, that uh, mm -hmm. this was before the coming of the settlers. Now you have natives, and they say, "Hey, let's give you European, or we want a native." So they were natives already preaching. So they're looking at Davis as a liberated slave, a freed slave. So freed means yeah. the same as liberated, right? Right. So the Davis is basically an emancipated slave. He's a Basa man who was sold into slavery, but the ship was rescued by the British Navy. And those captives that were taken from Traytown and Basel were resettled at Freetown. Davis is one of those. There were numerous ships, by the way, that left the Liberian coast and were liberated at, and, and the, passing, the, the captives were sent to Freetown. The people in Basel know that Davis is a liberated slave or a freed slave. Right. Even though they know he Basa and he was born among them, there's a stigma attached to him. This is before the Elizabeth ever left New York. How profound is this? This is the year 1819. Yeah. So we always talk about the coming of the freed slaves, like it's some kind of people who are out of the, the, the country for 800 years or 3,000 years or something. You're talking about a guy who still spoke the language. 
And here Kate is saying that the, the other Baza people said they didn't want any liberated slave preaching to them. Mm -hmm. You see the stigma. <laughs> so when people say liberated slaves, and I thinking when we say it, we don't necessarily think Baza people, just like when we say freed or liberated slaves, we don't think or remember recaptured Africans. Very important. No, it's important because we only think of these as people who have been, you know, away from their great great parents' time, right? That these people were actually cut off, cut away, you know, and they didn't know anything about the place uh, or their language or their connection. But in the last case of episode, Kenya, we had someone say they were not Africans. Yeah, I think that was a slip of tongue. Hmm. It was written. It was written. I, 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 didn't, I didn't know what he was kind of driving. Yeah, at so so here, because because people think it's, it's, it's somehow analogous to Israel. You, know, you got 3,000 years wandering in your 2,000 years wandering around in Europe, and then all of a sudden you come. But here, these are Africans. And as they set out their own mouths, this is Africa, and we are Africans as we know. No, a number of the people who repatriated were just one or two generations removed from Africa. Yeah. Right? Arthur Barclay, Dahomey, E.J. Roy, Abado. They said he was evil, but he was Abado. You have uh, um, you have all of these people. Stephen Allen Benson, son of recaptured Africans. Uh, many of them, their just grandparents were taken into slavery from Africa. This is the 1800s, the early 1800s. Some of these people were born in the late 1700s. So they were born of, of people who were born on the continent, many of the people that repatriated. So it, it, they were not too far removed a lot of times. Not always, but a lot of times. The generations were not that far removed. So that's important and to even also show that there was a presence of liberated people who had been in captivity already right. spreading the gospel before the Elizabeth ever left New York. If that doesn't shock people, nothing will. <laughs> you know, so we can move on. So you'll be glad to receive a, a European. And, and this uh, being glad to receive a European Mm -hmm. Also tells me that uh, they knew them. You yes. know, they knew they, they, right. They, they, they knew that hey, wasn't this because this was the it was in their generation. Yeah. So so if we also have we also have we're going to go into Lot Carey. Um, that the Lot Carey mission was named in his honor. So Lot Carey. Lot Carey was based on the, the, the people who repatriated through ACS. He was the first to open a church and a school on the grain coast of the people who came from, from ACS. So Lot Carey's whole purpose of getting on the Brig Nautilus, which was the second ship that went to Sherbrooke, Lot Carey's whole purpose was, and he went along with recaptured Africans. His whole purpose was to open a church and a school for indigenous children and recaptured Africans. So just like Davis, Lot Carey is also a missionary. Many people who went went back to to Liberia in the early stages went as missionaries. We're going to talk about that process and how that changed the culture. So we can go to the next slide unless you have a question or anyone else does. By February of 1828, Ashman was too sick to continue his work, suffering extreme swelling and edema as well as pain in the joints. He returned to the United States where he died that summer. Before leaving Liberia, Ashman designated the assistant agent Lot Carey as his successor. Carey had been born a slave in Virginia in about 1780 
and had experienced Christian conversion in 1807 while working in a Richmond tobacco factory. His wife died in 1812, and in 1813, he purchased his and his children's freedom. That same year, he became a Baptist minister, and by 1819, he was involved with the American Colonization Society. The society sent him to the colony in 1821, and he had become an essential player in Ashmont's plans for development and expansion. In September 1828, Latkere moved most of the antelope captives to their new town behind halfway farms on Stockton Creek when a new agent sent to replace Kerry visited in December of 1828. He was very impressed by the former captives' accomplishments. They have been on their lands but three months and have already have built themselves comfortable houses and closed their lots and have their cassava plantains and potato growing most luxuriantly, wrote Rich, Richard Ronda. He though the lo the location healthy, it was removed some distance from the mangroves that lined Stockton Creek. Agent Ronda decided to name the settlement Kerry Town to honor the, his predecessor. But that name never stopped. Instead, the liberated captives instead insisted on the name New Georgia. Yeah. So this ties into last week's episode. So if you didn't watch uh, the second episode of the history of our culture, go back and watch that. It really focuses on recaptured Africans. Lot Carey started this process um, when he arrived, of course. So 1828, he had already solidified um uh most of the i mean not 1828 but before he died he had literally had already established most of this and one of the things i wanted to mention too is that that lot carry that school that lot carry put there was specifically to baptize and christianize recaptured africans and indigenous children So the Lot Carey mission that was named in his honor was serving the purpose to of ministering to indigenous people. This has to be, that's why it was named in his honor because they were carrying on his mission. So do you have any other questions on this? Because I think we covered a lot of this thing with the recaptured mm -hmm. Africans the previous episode and who they were and the antelope ship that the people who established New Georgia were really from the Congo rainforest region. Mm -hmm. um, what I want our viewers to keep in mind is uh, we are discussing the history of our culture. So all the influences now we're talking about the Christian influence. Right. This is how it started. And that's where that's where we're going with this. Yes. This is about the Christian influence. So if you want to go back the other two episodes, please don't kind of say, why are you not talking about this? We already talked about it. That's why. <laughs> yeah. So go back if you haven't watched the previous ones and watch them. So I wanted to say something. I'm going to show images. Now, these are Native African women. These are nine Native African women who were at the, the, the day's mission on the St. Paul River. In the year 1909, they were photographed. Hmm. Yeah. And their names are here. Right. Sister Grace Divison, Sister Hester Divison, Sister Eliza Kelly. I'm putting Sister there because they are church women. I see they are church women. That's how we address them. They're, they're church women. They're also, you know, grad. They're the graduating class of this girls' school. Go ahead. Maria Davis, Dolly White or Wild. Wild. Mm -hmm. Dolly Wild. Katie Massey, Sue Kelly. Jen Floyd and Selena Horace. Yes. Clearly, these are not their birth names. Yeah. Part of what some of these schools did, just like we discussed, you know, maybe we, you know, when we were talking about some oratory episode last year, when you adopt a religion and a culture, typically you'll change your name. The reason for that is, even in our traditional culture, 
when you go to the, the Sunday Society, you come out with a new name because you are now part of that tradition. Okay. If you become a Muslim, you then take on a name from the Quran. If you become a Christian, you take on a name from the Bible. The issue here is all of the names are not necessarily biblical. They're associating European names with biblical names or, or acceptable names for people who are Christian to have. The same way that Muslims will take on Arab names that are not necessarily from the Quran. So there's this cultural thing that's happening, cultural shift. Because of the way Christianity is introduced, they are now adapting Western names very early on. It also blurs the lines of, lines of ethnicity in Liberia. The subsequent generations will say, oh, Dali Wal was an American Liberian. Dali Wal was probably a Gola or Vai young woman. <laughs> what so, so the the yeah. So what ends up happening is they now value these things because the traditional name is associated with your traditional beliefs. You are now born again into a new faith, and you take on a new name. That is the concept. So these names were not forced because you have cases where many or not many, but some people said, "I'm keeping my name." Right. Or sometimes it would take their father's name and a biblical name and combine the two. <clears throat> but many people, especially because they were taken into these schools as children, gladly adopted new names. This is the case with even Daniel Howard's father. Many of the Howards in Liberia are indigenous people, Basa and Pele, right? And Lama. There's a large Zaza, I mean, uh, a clan of Howards and Zaza because they adopted the name early on. So ethnicity and name are not the same. And many Christians who adopted Christianity early on changed their names in this fashion. And this is a global phenomenon. This is not unique to Liberia. This happened among indigenous Americans. It happened in Asia. It happened all over Africa. This is what was indicative of that time period. Right. In, in my hometown, where we are, the missionaries, people, it's an orphanage school. They came from all over the uh, the region. And we have names, you know. I, uh, and I'm saying this because uh, one of our viewers said, hey, if I were alive, I wouldn't have taken those names. From what I saw, I, I don't know if the, the names were forced or not, but the people took, and we were, they were happy to have those names, right? Right. We, we have... Uh, Later on, when the missionaries left and they've grown, some went back to their old name, but that, that's that's how it was. And I don't think it was forced. It, sometimes these things, when you were there, they it, are like, it, it, Yeah, it's not forced, Dennis. It, more, more often than not, it wasn't forced. It was voluntary. And it, it continues to this day, right? People leave, people are in the interior. How many people are giving their children indigenous names when they're born? Everybody's name is princess and gifty and... This, I'm naming my son Horace and this. I mean, people constantly are giving their children names that they think sound Western because that's what they value. Yeah. That is what they value. And people are very, it happened in my own family. <laughs> you know, people are given names at birth and they change it. I don't like this. I'm going to take, you know, a different name. And then you have so many reasons people do it because they're, you know, Sometimes, and we're, we're going to get into this as we progress, but mm -hmm. a lot of times uh, we attribute um, choices that our people made, voluntary choices that our people made with some kind of forced system. And I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why. Um, were there cases where someone was so, hey, you can't pronounce your name, you got to use this name? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Right? Or if you had a name that's associated with society, Bush, no, you've got to change your name to Mary. So it depended on the church. It depended on the mission school. It depended on many circumstances. My, but as my, we know, go ahead, Dennis. My father left Biblical and went to King Williamstown for school. His name was Peter Jack. Mm -hmm. He went there. According to what he told me, 
his mm -hmm. teacher was also Peter. <laughs> he used that name. That's how his name was changed from Peter to Wilson. Oh wow! <laughs> so, so I mean, will you say he was false? Will you say this was? So things happen, and yeah. it was not a matter of. And that was the culture at that time. I mean, your teacher. I mean, this, these people were so respected. You couldn't have the same name. So, <laughs> it's and, just and how would people call? You know calling the teacher or calling you and then the teacher is answering so I, I also want to point something very important out about mm -hmm. names the way how we we look at names today is not the way we used to look at names traditionally in our tradition when a child is born typically especially for people in this uh northern and western part of liberia you don't really get your name until you go through the traditional school and you come out with your name that you'll carry for the rest of your life. So whatever your parents call you around the yard as a baby, when you're taken into the Sunday or the Coral, you come out, that's when you really have a name. And you don't inherit names from your parents in most of the traditions in Liberia. Before the introduction of Western culture, you had your own name. So you could have brothers that all each have their own name and not their father's mm -hmm. name. It was really in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s that this idea among majority of the population of Liberia of having a last name that you inherit came about. It is very recent. So we can look back on this time period and want to judge people who didn't look at naming in the same way that we do today. And yeah. people say, oh, they took your real name and get you. These people were going to a process where even if they had stayed in a tradition, their name would have been changed coming out of the Sunday or the Quarrel. So now they're looking at this religious process as their own society push. When they come outside, they get their name. And so it was normal for our people. So this is why you didn't have really real resistance to it because it didn't see the problem. No. Because so now today your children are Ja, your father was Ja, right? Right. And so if they try to change your son's name, he's going to say no, my tradition is I'm named after my father. He was named after his father. You go back 5 generations, that was not a case. In fact, that you only have one name, right? So yeah, for the was... most part. Or right. if you had two names, it didn't matter. It was still only your name. It wasn't something you passed on because your children are not you, right? Yeah. So the 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 system and the, our understanding of naming is different. So we really shouldn't project our ideologies and our belief systems on the past, especially on our our ancestors when we've gone through a transition in the way we understand things. Right, and, and these people. I mean, if they were going back to their villages, their villagers or their siblings or whoever will, will still call them by the name they knew them by, right? Right. I, I don't know if I went, in fact, if I went, I mean, it's kind of a little modern now. So if I went back mm -hmm. to Dominican, and it's, then this job would not really sound, would not, uh, soon you say Chile, you know who you're talking about. That's how they will mm -hmm. call me, right? So whatever name I take, Outside of that, that's my business. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go on to the next slide. In 1913, one of the most remarkable and controversial preachers in the history of West African Christianity began preaching in the Ivory Coast and from there to the Gold Coast, that's Ghana. His name was William Wiley Wilson, 1865 to 1929. He was described as a crew, a member of the indigenous Grebo peoples of Liberia. The term crew was not exclusive to cloud people in the early 1900s. The effect of Harris's ministry was electrifying, as Gordon Halliburton observes. And this is what he said. The whole population of the religions through which he passed accepted him as the authentic voice of God and has his messenger to revitalize their religion and society, which subjected as they were to, to new and increasing pressure of European colonialism, 
were failing them in a time of crisis. The method used by Harris and his companions was to approach a village singing songs accompanied by the calabash rattles. Local people would gather and Harris would preach fervently, inviting them to renounce traditional religious practices and believe in God. The thousands that did that did so were immediately baptized from the water in Harris's God dish in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the Bible was placed on their heads. <laughs> You know, yeah, and, and I can, I can, I can even you know think of the songs they were singing. It would be something like, "Dear, dear one, you're over me, water. Come to Jesus and be saved." Some, yeah. something like that. He was, uh, Harry, I believe, Harry was saying, and the people would say, "You know, dear one, you're over me, water." I believe that. Yeah. So it's it's. <laughs> Fun fact about about Prophet Harris. Uh, Buffalo Chambers says he's a descendant of Prophet Harris. I thought that was interesting, but yeah, this this is a um, so this is just to show that the faith now is being exported. Now you have a Grebo man exporting. He's an evangelist taking this to Cote d'Ivoire in Ghana, yeah, and spreading the faith outside of Liberia. In fact, he spent his entire, there's a, a whole monument to his honor in Ivory Coast. Right. You know, this is, this, so this is a legacy of this practice in Liberia. And this man was part of the, the uh, or a result, a product of Bishop Ferguson's ministry. And we'll, we'll talk about this Bishop Ferguson in the next, mm -hmm. um, go to the next slide, please. Yeah, and, and when we were in, in Ghana and the refugee camp, we had an Assembly of God Church. And the uh, the Ghanaian Assembly of God Church would tell us to say, "Hey, it was a Liberian who came here and established the AG Church." Mm -hmm. That's that's what they told us. So this is this is uh, this is this is recent, I would say. Yeah. Well, I mean, Prophet Harris was doing this in you know he started doing this in around 1910. Yeah. 1908, 1910, 1915. So I mean, this is a picture of of some. Uh, converts, uh, new uh, Christian converts um, at the Days Mission School. And this was uh, taken around 1895. We got these, uh, these young men, most of whom have Western names. We have an example of, um, of uh, uh, bishops and other people of significance who were from by Angola ethnic groups that had Muslim parents that wanted them to go to school to learn the Western language and writing system in addition to what they were already taught in their own traditions. And then they would go and convert, change their religion, become Christians, and abandon Islam. So it wasn't only traditional African cultures that were being abandoned. A lot of Muslims converted to Christianity. Bishop Gardner is a good example of this. He was a son of Muslim uh, clergy, was sent to go learn at, at a Christian school and then decided to become a Christian and then rose to the, to the rank of bishop. Bishop Gardner was by. So we have this happening frequently at this period in history. So some of these students that you're seeing, some of them come from traditional African uh, religious background, and some of them come from Islamic culture, Vi and Maninka mostly, and some Gola. And, and there's uh, Bishop Ferguson. Simeon yes. Bishop Ferguson was born in Charleston, South Carolina. Oh, I love the food in Charleston. <laughs> His family immigrated to Liberia six years later where he attended mission schools. Appointed a teacher in 1862, he began his studies for the ministry and was ordained deacon in 1865 and a priest two years later. He served as assistant minister and later as rector of St. Mark's Harper in Liberia. Ferguson had a special interest in education, which was demonstrated in his work. He founded Cottoner College in Liberia, 
the Julius C. Emory School, and countless other schools in local villages. Consecrated in, 1860, in 1885 as the missionary bishop of Cape Palmas and its adjacent territory, the diocese later being changed to that of Liberia and West Africa. He was the first American-born person of African descent to become bishop of Liberia and the first African member of the House of Bishops. As the fourth bishop of Liberia, Ferguson made a significant impact on the spiritual and educational growth of the church in Liberia and on the country itself. Yeah, so Ferguson is, is a prime example of how evangelism and literacy, evangelism and Western education went hand in hand. So Ferguson opening churches and schools. So as you become baptized, you become Christianized, you become educated, the two things were together. Unlike Islam, where they have education, they have a writing system, it was more elite, right? So the people who were literate in the Islamic culture, which predated this Christian culture on our coast, in, in, in many ways, in, you know, that's arguable, but in many ways, it was only elite people that learned how to write, you know, imams and scholars. It wasn't the masses who were being taught how to write Arabic, though they were being taught to memorize the Quran, everyone that was Muslim could not read and write Arabic. In this case, when they were initially spreading Christianity, with it, they're spreading literacy to the masses. So for the first time, literacy is being spread to ordinary people on the Grain Coast. We had literate people on the Grain Coast, but this was an elite thing. It was considered to be, you know, you had to be somebody to learn these things. You had to be, a, you know, royalty. You had to be a, a, an imam. You had to be some kind of religious leader, some kind of scholar to be able to learn to read and write. Here, these missionaries are teaching some of the most lowly people in the society how to read and write. So it's very powerful. And Ferguson, if you want to attribute the, the spread of education, and Christianity to an in, one individual, Ferguson carried more than his responsibility in the spread of this. He opened schools, he opened churches, he devoted his life to both literacy and to the spreading of the word of God. Next slide. Bishop Ferguson. Bishop Ferguson established Cottonwood College in 1889 with the aid of a $5,000 gift from Robert F. Cotton. The treasurer of the Board of Missions, Ferguson purchased 100 acres of land, hired an all librarian staff, and built Epiphany Hall, the school's first permanent structure. Over the years, other permanent buildings will replace the remaining initial attached hut structures of Constitution. The school's departments included theological, agricultural, and industrial education. Ferguson's purpose for the school was to give the youth of Liberia and Africa the skills to meet the physical and spiritual needs of a growing population. Wow. Yeah. So for those who don't know that uh, Cottonton started in Maryland before going to Bond County. Yeah. <laughs> so the the next slide is, is a slide of um, Bishop Ferguson in the center there with some people. So Bishop Ferguson is 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 one of the my favorite um christians in history period <laughs> hands down uh this guy was was incredible he was a mentor to one of my favorite uh, liberian people uh, uh, my favorite chief justice um james j dawson who was also a former vice president james j dawson ended up marrying bishop ferguson's daughter as we know james j dawson was vi um, and his parents were educated early on, and he was born to, to, to Christian parents, but his father and mother were uh, described at the time as being born to heathen parents. So his parents, being baptized and Christianized and educated, were sent to Maryland as teachers, where James J. Dawson was born in Maryland, but he wasn't gribble, he was by. Unless being born in Maryland makes you gribble. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> but he was he was in he was in Maryland where he was born, and uh, Bishop Ferguson uh, he ended up marrying Bishop Ferguson's daughter. But that's just an interesting uh, thing. But this man was in, uh, a prolific educator. This is yeah. what he wanted everyone to be empowered to read and write. And uh, and to be educated to the highest level possible, and he he, he de dedicated his life to this. So this this is a picture of um, Bishop Allen, who you see standing there on the far right of the screen. Bishop Allen um, with some other uh, it looks like another evangelist in one of the uh, the local towns. Uh, probably went there to go preach. We can go to the next slide. Yeah. Maybe that's even a church. Could be. Henry Stewart. This is Stewart. yeah. This is Henry Stewart. Henry Stewart was uh, educated early on. He's a, he was he was um, an indigenous man. Uh, went and opened a school up to St. Paul uh, at Mount Coffee, to be specific open a school at Mount Coffee where he, it was basically a free school where he was teaching young people. And in those days when you open a free school and you're teaching kids like indigenous children how to read and write, the parents would, you know, bring you food and, oh, you know what, I got some cassava for you or, oh, thank you, you know, Mr. Stewart, teacher Stewart, you know, here's a chicken for you or we went and brought a goat from the farm. So even you open a school, they didn't have money to pay you to educate their children. They would gift you stuff. But I want to also say a lot of the children, so that would be the case with some, a lot of the children that Henry Stewart took to educate as well were kind of what they call castaway or throwaway children, children who didn't have parents or who were being abused in the homes of the caregivers. Liberia had a system, you know, as a, I, I believe as a result or a remnant of the transatlantic slave trade, where we developed a culture of pawning children. We developed a culture of pawning children. And so a lot of times, if you owed a debt to somebody, you could not pay, you would give them a child as payment. So children then became a thing. And I think that is a remnant of the transatlantic slave trade and our participation in it. Because they used to sell children. So now slavery has been abolished, but they're still pawning children. So they're giving children to other people who are not. In fact, this ridiculous practice occurred in my lifetime. I know people who were pawned <laughs> as children that are my age group. So this mm. is a, something that lasted well into the 1980s, early 80s. But in this particular case, it was very, very common, much more common. It was disturbing in this time period. So a lot of these kids that were pawned would be rescued by Henry Stewart and educated. So it was a school slash orphanage that he and his wife were running uh, with these kids a lot of times. Uh, uh, Cole, you say you saw that pony. How did it look like? I have a friend who was pawned. Her brother, her brother, her older brother, who was probably about 15 or 20 years older than she was. He had caused some problems, and so he gave her to the family and said, oh, "Let y'all take my sister because I can't pay you back." You know, mm -hmm. kind of how you would give somebody a goat or a cow. And she was forced to work in those people's home in in, in Bone County, forced to work in those people's home as basically a slave when she was a child, and she couldn't go home, and she was abused and and and. And, and tormented and you know it was horrible and i'm sure it's not just her but this is somebody that's my age group that went through this experience oh, wow I, I i didn't see that in my side of the country that's good mm -hmm. it's very it's very common it was very common so missionaries um uh from america went to Liberia during a period in time when the United States was still practicing some of the worst segregation in human history. Uh, missionaries went to Liberia during a time period, as you can see, as early as 1819 from America when slavery was still legal in the United States. And even after slavery was abolished, 
and the United States was segregated, a lot of missionaries left the Jim Crow South where black people were not allowed to drink from the same drinking fountains. They couldn't look white people in the eye. You know, if you're in the Jim Crow South, you didn't go to school together, you didn't eat in restaurants together, you didn't sit together, you didn't even worship together in the same church. They left this kind of horrific racism and went to Liberia to evangelize. And though they felt they were doing God's work, they took with them this very, very uh, dehumanizing attitude toward African people. So missionaries with boots on often didn't feel they needed to walk when they could take people who they felt were less human than themselves and force them to be carry them through the rainforest and do all kinds of things. This book behavior, um, if you read some of the writings of, of Mrs. Traub, who was a, a Pella woman who became a Lutheran educator, she and many other Liberians, both descendants of indigenous people and repatriates, started having issues with European missionaries because they practiced this type of segregation and also the type of what they called abuse towards indigenous people. So we'll go to the next slide. And I have I saw an example of this in pictures because they are the missionary who went to my part of the country called mm -hmm. Mandra Ramsey. I have the pictures. He was carried in Hamo because they first came through Maryland, then to the River G before going to that part of Sino. And I, I have the pictures where she was being carried in Hamo by the missionaries, even on missionary journeys. Yeah. This guy is, is relaxed. Yeah, must have been. It must have been nice. And and I don't know, you know, he wearing boots, and you can't see in the picture, but these men were barefoot. The man with boots is being carried by the men without shoes. And that weight on their head, mind you, for miles. Yeah, what, was this a missionary too? Yes. W which year could this possibly be? So these photos, these specific photos are from the 1930s. Okay. But I'm about, sure this went on. Hmm? No, talking about pawning, Jimmy Isma said my grandmother was pawned to my grandfather and they had my mother. Yeah. Very common in those days. Evangelist at Zaza District. Reverend yeah, Parker. So, the, so these men are, of course, uh, Loma and Pella mostly. Um, I believe Abraham was. Maninka in, 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 in origin, and then he uh, be, uh, became baptized. A lot of the people at Mullenberg, at Day Mission, in, in Cape Mount, a lot of these people were Muslim people who converted to Christianity. A lot of, of the, the Gola as well, Muslim people who converted to Christianity. So um, you've got Abraham. Um, I'm sorry, you go ahead, Dennis. This is right, this is Reverend Parker. <laughs> So Reverend Parker mm -hmm. is the first one. Abraham of Fisibu, Fisibu, mm -hmm. Fisibu that's in Lofa. I think that's a Gisi country. Yeah, but I think I think um, he was from the notes I was reading. He was um, actually no. Uh, Reverend Parker is not in this photo. Sorry, I cropped him out. So Abraham is the first gentleman. Oh, okay. Yeah, and and he. So we have to remember that people were, the way how Lofa set up, you have districts, but you had people from different, Maninka people were pretty much all over the place. Yeah. Lofa, Nimba, and Bong, these are the descendants of Samori Turi's people, right? So they're spread out and they're in pockets in Nimba, Lofa, Bong. Whereas when you go to Bopulu, they have an old presence there. It's different. So there they have their clans and their chiefdoms more established than the, the central territory. So it's a, it's, so you have Maninka people settled among everyone in these areas. 
Hmm. So you see Ibrahim of Fisible, Samuel Howard mm -hmm. of Zozo, yeah. Samuel Coney of Salaye, mm -hmm. David Harris of Zolowu, Ale mm -hmm. Yela, and Andrew Rogers of Baye. Baye is my uh, the home of my friend Shiro Kamara. <laughs> yeah. So there we have it. <laughs> Now this, so this is the previous picture. I just wanted to say something. If you can go back, we'll come back to this, this, please. So this is to show you, these are evangelists from these places and they are going back to minister to their people. And their children, are going to be educated and they're going to be Christian. Their grandchildren are going to be educated and they're going to be Christian. And they're going to be carrying these names. Howard, Harris, Rogers. These are not people that want to go live with people to get names because the, the understanding that we have is that everybody was living with somebody and the person gave them their name. These are people who voluntarily took these names. Because everyone that came out of that school did not have a Western name. It's very important to point this out. This was just the trend. It's what people, this is, they thought that this was better. And the reason a lot of times people thought this was better Many of the people who went to school early on came from really deplorable and extremely brutal beginnings. Our cultures, especially as they first were being, you know, in the, in the Northern and Central Territories, they didn't welcome Western education and Western culture the same way. A lot of the, the powerful people rejected Western education and didn't want their children to be a part of it. So the missionaries would have to pay people for children. The Liberian government would have to pay people to send their children. And the children that they often sent, not always, because sometimes some very wealthy, powerful people wanted the children to be educated if they were enlightened and thought differently, right? But for, a, for the majority, it was orphan children, pawned children, abused children, victims of war, who were displaced. The same thing with the early frontier forces. They were usually gathered from defeated warriors or victims of other wars. And then, you know, given training and then sent back and then they end up, you know, they ended up being very abusive and, and paying debt and having vendettas, but that's a different episode. <laughs> but in this case, a lot of these people who chose this route were coming from extremely humble beginnings, runaways, people who ran away from their captors. So when you're talking about around 1900, 1920, in this part of Liberia, many people were being subjected to some grinding oppression in the hands of the people in the communities that held land and power. Wow. So cool. these men that you see, a lot of times they were willing to do this because of the things that they went through and they were against the cultures that brought them up because of the way they were treated. So they yeah. felt that this was a better way. Right. And Carl, I saw that even in my own town, the missionaries, the people that went on the mission, most of them, like uh, tr someone will run away from taking Sasewu in one place and come on the mission. You know, because people that were accused of witchcraft, some were mm -hmm. banished from their towns. These were the people that the missionary took. Yeah. So I can I can relate. Hmm. I love this picture. Yeah. 
I like to pick fuss on Jewel, but her parents were so attractive, beautiful people. <laughs> she's she's a beautiful child of beautiful people. I mean, look at her mother. Look at her right. mother's cheekbones. Gorgeous woman. So this is Vice President Jewel Howard Taylor's parents um, in Zozo. Her father was from Zozo. Her father was Loma from Zozo. And he, her mother, Pele, they were Christian. They had gone to school. There is a lot written about her parents having lived with, you know, Congo people. And that's how they got the name. This is not true. Moses Howard didn't live with people. <laughs> Moses Howard went to Mullenberg Mission School. He didn't live with Congo people. He went to school. He knew his home. He used to go back to his town, you know, on vacation. So this idea that everybody lived with people is a false concept. This boy went to school when he was young. This young woman went to school, got educated. They were both nurses. When they got married, they were stationed at Phoebe Hospital in Bone County. Joel was born in Zozo. And they went went and went on to Phoebe to Banga with her with her with her parents. So they didn't live with people. They adopted the Howard name. In the previous slide, it was another Howard. So that whole family from Zozo had taken the Howard name. Not because they lived with people. They liked the name. Wow. Look at the uh, Jewel's mother. So beautiful. Gorgeous woman. And, and look, look, look at, look at uh, this young man. man. And, and, and it's not just, I mean, look at this style. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just classy, just yeah. classy, beautiful. And, and you know, these are professional nurses. These are professional nurses. And at that time, you know, you, you graduate from Mullenberg, you graduate from the nursing school, you go to Phoebe. I mean, they saved lives. They worked as a team. They did a beautiful job, you know, there. And she comes from, she comes from you know, people who were of service. They served their community. Besides being nurses, they were also evangelists. So um, what a wonderful um, couple. This, this uh, was taken somewhere between 1945 and 1950, that photo. And they were very young when they got married. Hmm. This is the inside of a church in one of the villages that the, that the people built just to show. And this, this picture is from 1924 to 1926, so somewhere in the mid-1920s. This, was taken. this is yeah, the Bella Fine Church. The inside interior of it, and you can see the pulpit there. Oops. Um, the pews, you know. Hmm. I can see the communion table. Yeah, so Jeremiah <laughs> Carter is another one. Jeremiah was Pellet, and he was an evangelist. And he would go to villages, you know. Um and 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 minister to people, and here he is. It says he's playing that that Aware game, the counting game, with mm -hmm. one of the the townsmen. And this is he's in the town of Wozi in this picture, Wozi, which is not far from Zozo. Thank you, brother. So, Jeremiah. and in this time period, Pella and Loma people, the language was really interchangeable. They spoke each other's languages, just like you know, um, many other people. But uh, Byron Z. Traub and, and John Clinton are the two in the front here. I'm not sure who the other people are in the background, but those are the only two identified. This photo was taken in 1940. Yeah, Georgia is son. <laughs> you said what? No, I said Georgia is son. Now this is Byron Traub and uh, John Oh, we skipped Trump. over Georgia and his son. I'm sorry. Let's go back. Yeah, so George, George Studd. George Studd Gola, he's a Gola man. And this is his son. They call his son Te. I don't know if that's a Gola name, Te. If anyone's watching, can you tell me what this is, Te? Uh, Gribble have this name too, Te. Okay. Te, yeah, Gribble have Te. Okay. Especially, especially the Gribble from River G. They from use River that G? Name. It's good. Te means good. Okay, so if it's a River G, that's like. Maybe it's in Basa and Gribble, I mean, Gola also, I don't know. Yeah. But um, interesting. Let's go to the next slide, please. And that's the one I was talking about. Um, 
uh, Byron D. Traub and John D. Clinton, the two in the front. Clinton is a is a shorter is a shorter man. We get we got a lot of pictures. We can zoom through, and then we can have some questions. Yeah. Um, again, John Clinton, who was the shorter man in the the previous photo, this is him with his family in front of their home. Oh, oh, this here. So yeah, he's the the man in the front, the shorter man to the front right. Oh, okay. And if you go to the next picture, this is him now with with his wife and his children. In the upstairs building. <laughs> yeah. So this this was this was also taken around 1940. Right. The, the new Focal Church. Yeah. So this is a so you having now the masses of the people in the country becoming Christian. This happened in the 20th century. The masses of Liberian people becoming Christian occurred in the 20th century. So you having this 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. We can go to the next slide. It's just, you know, more. Um, Samuel. Yeah. Just an example of Liberian Christians, first generation Christians. Now, a lot of times the children would arrive. This is a group of kids that have arrived at the mission school. And when I when I point out this thing about people pawning children and children having been basically orphans or being abused. This particular photo was taken around 1920. These children that used to show up at the mission schools in those days were not the that's and I want to be very clear that yes, powerful chiefs sent their children to school. I want to be clear that there are exceptions, but the majority of these people who were educated early on came from an abused class. They came from people who were cap war captives because we had the rolling wars at the end of the uh, 19th century through the early 20th century. Many children were displaced and taken into captivity and forced to work, beaten. And so when they become educated, they start writing their stories of torture and abuse at the hands of their captives. One of the Liberians, Andrew Jackson, wrote about how he had to escape captivity. He was captured at war. He later on went to Tuskegee University in the United States. So a lot of these children, their parents have either been killed in war, in these rolling ethnic wars that we had, or clan wars, not necessarily ethnic, sometimes it's within the same ethnic group. And they would be taken, you know, into captivity. And Oftentimes, the missions school, along with the Liberian government, would purchase their liberty and take them into the school and educate them. So while this is not chattel slavery, it was a form of slavery. Mm. And when they graduate, you know, this is a, a group of, of such children attending school. And this particular photo is somewhere around 1900. Yeah, I can see the confident building the kids, man. You look at them. Yeah. So now <laughs> they're going to school. They're eating. They're not being abused. I mean, they're still they're still being made to work by these missionaries. Don't get me wrong, but it's a different for them. It's a relief compared to what they had endured. Hmm. One of the most profound things that occurred with Christianity being introduced to Africa in general was the imagery of Europeans as biblical figures. Europeans as biblical figures, Western Europeans as biblical yeah. figures, which is historically in inaccurate, but it had a lasting effect on the mindset of the people. 
Here are two children at a school in Liberia. These are the images that have been implanted in the minds and hearts of our people for many generations. Mm -hmm. And that's including me. Yeah. So when these children close their eyes to pray, the man there with his arm extended is who they pray to because they've been told that that is in fact Jesus of Nazareth yeah. and nobody questioned it. So when you close your eyes, this is who you think is receiving your prayers. We'll go to the next slide. Here's another example of children attending school in the 1930s, Christian school. They're in the schoolyard. Go to the next slide, please. Graduates in 1934 from the Mullenberg Boys School. And this was a high school? Mullenberg Boys School. Um, these were eighth grade graduates. And then they're mm -hmm. gonna go on to CWA or some other school to complete. So some of them are older because of the time they were taken into the school. Oh yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. And then, so here you have um, Professors. the University of Liberia. The reason this is here is because the University of Liberia thought philosophy, which is a branch of the, I mean, uh, theology is a branch of philosophy, but they taught theology. So a lot of people who went on to become ministers and pastors also went to the University of Liberia. And here's a, a, a photo of a group of, of, of educators or teachers from the teacher college. The and government of Liberia assumed full support and control of the college in 1900 from its founding until 1950. When it developed into the University of Liberia, it produced most of the country's leaders in spite of an inadequate funds and periods when it was on the verge of closing. So these are the teachers of yeah. Liberia College. That and this is a mixed group of, of ethnic people, um, indigenous, as well as uh, descendants of repatriated African-Americans. Let me go to the next slide. There's a procession of church women. Okay. This picture is from 1926, a procession of, I mean, 1930, sorry, 1930, and a procession of church women going to church in 1930. Look at her shoes and the dresses. And of course, you've got uh, this was the, um, the, 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 this, well, you all recognize this church. <laughs> so they took this photo was taken somewhere around 1945. And my church. My family church, Ganta Methodist. Oh, this is an error in the slide. Yeah. But forget about the writing there. This so this young man here, Ganta Methodist, he's got you know Sunday school, 9:30 a.m. morning worship 10. Um, and then it's it's uh, I, um it's it's got something there in mono. But here's this young boy posing with the sign. If you go to the next slide. Right. And, and let me try my 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 ma here. Oh. Cast and can know where I care, where I is God. So, yeah. yeah, come, let's worship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, come, let's worship God. And then the next slide has uh, Bishop King, uh, who was a bishop at Ganta Methodist for quite some time I think 12 years. Um, here he is with, with uh, Winfred, uh, Winnie Fred Harley, Dr. Harley's wife. Dr. Harley, who founded Ganta Methodist Mission, by the way, was not a minister or an evangelist. He was a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. We'll do another episode on him. Yeah. But, and here are some Liberians in 1955, Christians. Um, mm. And this is a situation where we have descendants of all of these people culturally similar, all considered, as far as everybody's concerned, 
They all Congo people <laughs> because they've been generationally educated, generationally exposed to Christianity and Western culture, and the lines between them are now blurred. You've got you know families like the Normans and 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 all of these different people interwoven. Um, the Howards and all these people interwoven and, and nobody can distinguish or differentiate between who is who anymore. And I, the next photo is, is absolutely fun. I love it. I love the country cloth. It, it, you know, the next, oh, this is the same as the one before, just another church yeah. scene. And then here you have the Black Nativity at, at the Lutheran Church, St. Peter's. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? Very beautiful. And he's, he's got a country cloth there. <laughs> this seemed 1955. And then we'll end with my uh, my home church. I took this picture in 2009. I got the Methodist. Hmm. This, all right. So we can open up the lines or read questions and then, you know. Ooh. So, so let's start with questions. Mm -hmm. Most of us say, where are the pictures from? <laughs> but that's that's not a main question. <laughs> uh, we're talking about names. Uh, Bo Wilson Miller said, that's the same in terms of the naming of the Global Inn and around Kipamos in the 1800s. They were named in their towns and villages as children entering the schools or upon being baptized. Their names given were mostly Western names. Yes. But here's a question that I have, and I've heard this narrative for a long time about mm -hmm. when we were talking about the conversion. Mm -hmm. So there's a question here uh, that the uh, people, the Mandingos refuse to adapt, to accept. Okay. And so shall we say the Mandingo resisted vigorously the Christian missionaries. Hence the Mandingos were sidelined. I've heard it many times. In your well, presentation, you gave examples of a Muslim being converted. But yeah, I think I think Mandingo it, specifically. Yeah, there was a lot of Mandingos converted, Mandinka people converted. In fact, um, I think I think we are too tribal in our thinking. A lot of people resisted Christianity. Yeah, you know, mom people did, you know, a lot of people, clans did. Not any one group, entire group resisted anything. Maningo people are not a monolith. As much as, as, as Samori Ture uh, fought to make Maninka a monolith and go back and watch a Samori Ture episode, um, there were still some people that said, you know, I'm going to change and, and change. But the reason most Maninka people are Muslim is because of Wosu. So please go back and watch the Samori Ture episode and, and understand why that happened. But to just make a statement and say Maninka people resisted vigorously the Christian missionaries, um, that is, if you look at, you know, um, the Bomi area and uh, 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 what is now Bopulu, this is true because they started seeing their children changing their religion. But it's not universally true. So when you speak of a resistance, you speak specifically of who did it, not the entire ethnic group. I think that's a bit, you know, um, inaccurate, and it's it, it, it's not. It doesn't paint a very um, complex picture. It, it simplifies things, and that gets to be a bit dangerous when you do that. And even if you're a Maninka yourself and you're doing it, it's still dangerous. It's because it's, it doesn't really tell the full story. Samuel Cole said, Christian missionaries in Liberia were just different from those from other parts of Africa. Only Liberia and Sierra Leone, you find so many with biblical and Western names. I, I completely disagree with that. I've been all over West Africa. That is very common in Christian areas yeah. for people to have Western names. So I don't true. know where he got that concept. Maybe he's only been to like Rio and Sierra Leone or only watched Nigerian movies, but you go to Nigeria, you see so many Peters and Pauls and Thomas and all kinds of stuff. So I don't know where that's coming from. Even you go to India, the uh, the Christian side, they have, yeah. they have Christian names. Mm -hmm. Alfred Dennis say, so when you guys will talk about the Fula Prince of Liberia, because I would like to know why Mandingos are citizens and Fula are not called. I don't want you to answer this. I'm just putting this to teach a lesson. 
Yeah, I'm going to say Fulani, Fulani people are Africans and, and all Black people are citizens of Liberia. And I think that um, that's just, Alfred needs to go and, and study a little bit more about Liberia. Because okay. citizenship is not granted based on a, on, on your, your so-called tribe or the language you speak. It's granted on you being a Black person. It's Negro clause. There's no tribe mentioned in the Constitution, and the Constitution determines citizenship. Yeah. So I, 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 anyway. uh, Freeman said, this is exactly the kind of curriculum that we should implement in our country. Uh, and people, there was a question also about, you know, what else this is being taught in Liberia. Yeah, I know people always ask that question. Yes, it's my friend Thomas Awaji, is this part of the history taught in liberal schools? This is something you he, can- He knows the answer to that. Don't mind you. <laughs> That's a sarcastic question. He went to school in library asking questions. Okay. Unless Thomas was born here like myself, he knows the answer. No, Thomas was born in Kawa in Liberia. <laughs> Okay, and, and I was uh, say Christianity and, and uh, Bible are two different names. So, my yeah, yeah, say the ex slave love to take credit for everything that happened in Liberia, and I don't know why they came to Liberia from slavery and were not allowed to read or write. So, I put this because we've dealt with this, especially the second part, a lot of time. Yeah, th that's just not true. <laughs> That's just not true. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we already dealt with it with Lot Carey. Lot Carey came as a missionary; he wasn't illiterate. So, is that everything? Yeah, somewhat. You know, thank you guys mm -hmm. so very much for this wonderful series. Um, and Martha says she changed her name, or Ma Yeda says she changed her name from Martha to Ma Yeda. You know, there was a, there's a, and which is good, right? If you want to, there's a, it's a wife sent for and son, and you know, the son Lamar was like, oh, I'm African, and he wanted to wear the African shirt and African this to show that you're African. And the father told him, you don't have to do that to be African, right? So it's the same thing that we are, you know, kind of maybe getting hope on the names. Yeah. You don't, you don't, you don't have the names. Really, don't do much. If you have the name now, I don't. If you want to keep it, keep it. If you feel yeah. that if you change it, yes, you can change it. There were a lot of us that came to America with even different names. So I approached one of my friends. I said, "When you become citizen, will you change your name back to your original name?" He said, "No. When I go to heaven, my name will be changed anyway. So I just keep it." Yeah. <laughs> If you just so, join us, this is the Library History Channel to uh, join us and talk to us, discuss, call, comment, call the number on the screen, 605-313-6004. Uh, as we have 15 minutes to close, the code is 791403-POUND. Call your saying something. Yeah, the, the, well, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stay another 15 minutes, but we have this, um, Concept like I see a comment from Haas Khan and it says, How can we educate our people that they're no longer Congo people in Liberia? It's not your place to tell people if they're Congo or not, because many Congo descendants are still in Liberia and they're proud of that heritage. Um, and I think we should celebrate that. There's many descendants of Congo people in Liberia, many descendants of repatriated African Americans people from Barbados and all over the, the, the Caribbean in Liberia. And They've been born in Liberia for generations, but they should be able to celebrate their 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 ancestors that repatriated as well. And Congo's uh, Mr. Uh, uh, kind of refers to uh, people, the descendants of recaptured Africans, um, and they are among us. I mean, uh, some of them very prominent citizens. So we shouldn't assume. I mean, we had a president that was a descendant of, of Congo's uh, Charles D. B. King. In fact, the only president that I know of that was a descendant of Congo's was Charles D.B. King. But um, yeah, we need to we need to celebrate that. I don't think it's right. something we should teach doesn't exist. I wouldn't want somebody to say I'm 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 not a mom woman, you know, because I wasn't born in Ghana. I think that's, you know, my children are mine by. They know that. 
Yeah, that, that's true. You know, and that's part of the what we think is political correctness in Liberia. If you say, you know, Congo, if you say a miracle Liberian, or if you say anything, else, oh no. And then we, we took it a step further and say, oh, you, then is you have your children, all your children in America. When you go by you two, you'll be Congo. You know, but yeah, it's just weird. We, we weird right. with some weird people. That's that's right. <laughs> we're just a bunch of weirdos. There's nothing everyone has not only should everyone be proud of their personal heritage, we should all be proud of each other's heritage. You know, there's, there's something beautiful about being in a country that has this kind of rich history. Mm -hmm. I embrace all of it. Some think if you say it, you're being divisive and discriminatory. That's why people try not to yeah. say, there we go one. But yeah. yeah, that uh yeah, those are all the comments we have. And um let's go. Yeah, we can we can go ahead and adjourn, but that's all I had to say. Thank you oh, all for watching. We, we got we got we got one one color, so let's oh, okay. let, let's get that color. Yeah, go 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 ahead and uh Set the stage for the next as I break down the color. Um, so next episode, we are going to be talking about the Caribbean heritage, the food and linguistic contribution of the people from the Caribbean and also uh, uh, African-Americans as well. Okay, Carla, go ahead. Your name and where you calling from? Hello. Uh, sorry for the tone of my voice. I'm slightly under the call. My name is Thomas Johnson, and I've called for two things. One, uh, during some of your programs, one of the pictures you, you display. Uh, my name is Thomas G. Johnson. And I'm calling from New York City. Scott Nolan. Go ahead, Thomas. Uh, is that of my uncle is a war dancer from Sabo Chicken. And I want to call and tell you about that. But uh, the purpose of my call today is to agree with calls. Yeah, my the purpose of my call today is to agree with calls. Go ahead, Thomas. You are listening. Stop listening to the to, to, to us and just talk through the phone. That the names, such as the Western names, Johnson and uh, Thomas, some of those names were truly acquired by our people. All right. All right. Uh, my father told a story. He's called Kure We Are Twe. Johnson. Kurewia said that he acquired the Johnson name when his uncle took him to Ghana on a tour in the 1920s. And as they got to Ghana, one had to adopt a name, whichever name you wanted, you acquired that name and he selected Johnson. Thank you. When he returned to Sabo and he started having his children, his son John was sent to school in a Barobo mission. And during registration time, John was asked uh, about his father's name and he indicated his father's name, Kude We Are Twe. The missionary simply wrote John Johnson because he heard. Johnson's name, so that over the period of time, his brothers started being called Johnson instead of David Twe, Sam Twe, Eliza Twe. That name Johnson stuck on us. So it, it was an acquired name. It was not a, a Congo name. We have ne never lived with any Congo persons. We have never lived with an American Liberian, but it was an acquired name by our father that we found it difficult to change after our brother, the elder one, just documented everything on Johnson, Johnson, Johnson. Yeah. 
Thank you. That, that's a that's 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 good. You said that because this is common. You know, people often think that everybody with that name either live with Congo people, American Library, and so on and so forth. And thank you, thank you for your contribution. Yeah, that was that was very interesting, Dennis. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of anecdotal stories like that. And I think most of the Western names that you see in Liberia just come from school, not from actually people living with people. Most of the time, it just comes from going to school. Yeah, we were in the class. My uh, the, the late his name was Kebano, and the, the guys that even I mean people that were that were even teaching were not missionaries. They were people from the same town, and they still changed his name. They say, "Oh, that is too hard to spell. You are Kenneth, so he became Kenneth Toe, but he didn't go to school as Kenneth Toe." <laughs> so that, that that happened. But we want to thank our viewers for for watching tonight and call. Thank you also for the presentation. Any final thoughts? Anything you want to say before we draw down the curtains? Um, no, I really appreciate all the comments and the questions. And um, next week, we're going to be talking about something a little more fun, which is about food and why do we eat kala and all these kinds of things. And um, we're going to talk about where that. Thank you. All right. Tomorrow, join us uh, at four o'clock. We have On Point with a uh, debate on training issues. And then at six o'clock, we're going to bring in some lawyers to talk about dual citizenship and also the cases at the Supreme Court, that is the uh, uh, Justice Namwe or the nomination of Councillor Musa Dean. Where is it now? That you know how things are going. Also, there are reports that uh, some the unity party is trying to challenge the citizenship of some members of the uh, House. And that may go to the Supreme Court. So we want to talk about that. Join us tomorrow on FOL Justice Forum at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Until then, we close with our song that says, we are all Liberians. Have a good night and God bless you. We are Liberians. Liberia is our home. Liberia people.